Thank you. Can you all hear me in the back? All good. All right. Cool. So uh, has anybody here heard of Apache Flink? I see some hands. All right. OK, cool. Nice audience. <laughs> so I guess what I would like to talk about you today is, let's say, a different optic on Apache Flink, right? A different angle uh, that we can see, uh, that we can look at stream processing and, um, and Apache Flink in particular, which is uh, not so much about real-time analytics, but it's more about scaling uh, applications, and in particular, what we call stateful and event-driven um, applications. Um, so constant dimension was already. So um, I found the data artisans uh, about three years ago. Uh, we saw that there was <clears throat> a lack in technology uh, to do data processing in a way that it's stateful, uh, fast, fault tolerant, consistent, etc. That was sort of the birth of Apache Flink um, and the company itself. What we are doing is that, uh, first of all, we are contributing most of our code to the open source. So we are driving the major uh, development directions of Flink. Uh, and we are providing an enterprise uh, stream processing uh, platform that includes Apache Flink uh, that is called the DA platform. By the way, Flink had its latest release, latest uh, major release 1.3 last night. So if you haven't tried it out, uh, now it's a good time to, to go and download. Yeah. Um, what is Apache Flink? It's a stateful stream processor. Uh, it's chosen by uh, some of the biggest uh, companies that have to do with, with real-time data processing. And it's one of the biggest uh, and fastest growing open source communities in the big data space. Um, so by means of introduction, let me qualify a little bit um, what I, the, the scope of these applications that I'm talking about. So lots of software that we are building uh, in, you know, or, or that everyone is building in companies is number one, event driven um, and asynchronous, meaning that something happens to the world and then an application needs to react to that thing that happened in the world. The, the flip side of that is an application that is asking constantly the world, is something happening, is something happening, is something happening, right? Uh, so here we are, basically talking about applications that are event driven. So something happens and I need to do something with it. And in order to do something with it, I, I'm not just deciding is that interesting or no, that would be sort of a, a little filter, right? But I need to do something a little bit more complicated, meaning that I have to keep around uh, state, yeah? Uh, and for example, if you're building an application and in your development team there is a discussion of which database we're gonna use for this application, that's a good indication that you have state. Yeah, you don't need to use a database for state, but you can. Um, and examples of such applications are, you know, numerous websites, authentication systems, fraud detectors, recommender systems, pretty much, you know, a, a lot of software. Yeah, just a lot of software. Um, so data streaming, so who, so I guess since you have heard of Apache Flink, you've probably heard of data streaming. So data streaming is a new paradigm um, to look at uh, how data, how we interact with data from generation to analysis to action. Um, for me, and in particular for this talk, data streaming serves as an architectural paradigm to scale stateful event-driven applications and the term itself uh, admittedly has a confusing history. So data streaming, uh, the same technology has been used for many use cases and has appeared in, in many different contexts. So just a little bit of history. So first I will call this prehistory. Um, there was a big wave um, in the 2000s, and a little bit before on uh, what was then called and probably still is called CEP systems, so complex event processing. Uh, there was a lot of action in academia. A lot of, uh, of these academic projects became uh, companies uh, that, that were later acquired by other companies, for example, Streambase by Tipco, lots of others. Um, and there are a lot of these, um, I would almost call them legacy, uh, CEP products offered by, by a number of very large software vendors. Yeah? So that's sort of the, the prehistory of the whole thing. 
Um, now, the, what I call the first wave here really happened when, when Apache Storm uh, started coming out. So that was an attempt to make uh, data streaming, meaning continuous processing of data, scalable. So make this work at scale, at scale similar to what Hadoop was operating in. Um, and then people uh, were talking a lot about uh, something called the Lambda architecture. And the main idea there is that if you want to do something with the data, you have a continuous ingestion pipeline and you have a stream processing application that is analyzing this data continuously, but it's not accurate, yeah, just because uh, the limitation of, of technology. And then at the end of the day, you run exactly the same computation on the data that you have collected during the day, and that was called the batch job, and that gives you the result at the end of the day that you can trust. So you can get sort of approximate results during the day, and then you get to have an idea of what's going on in the business, and then you can get exact results at the end of the day. Um, so, so that was the Lambda architecture. And then what I would call the second wave, which is still going, is let's say uh, accurate processing, so accurate analytics, so no more Lambda architecture. You can do everything with a stream processor. You can do everything in real time. You don't need this batch job to run at the end of the day, uh, which has many benefits. Um, but essentially, this is analytics on your data faster. And this is the premise of, uh, of many projects. So Flink is in that domain. Uh, BIM is in that domain. BIM is a project uh, that, that was started by Google um, that defined a very nice way of thinking about streams and data streams around Windows, around event time, and so on. Fling is following the same paradigm. Uh, Spark streaming um, is, is in that wave, um, et cetera. And then um, what I call here the third wave goes a little bit beyond that. So we are not talking anymore strictly about applications that analyze data, but we're talking about applications that analyze data and then take an action on this data. So think of this as more operational, transactional applications rather than analytics that create a dashboard that someone looks at. Yeah. Um, and the basic, so the basic principles of, of stream processing is number one, um, we're talking about data that is produced continuously all the time, and, and it, it constantly changes. And most data in the world fits in this category. So I, I cannot think very easily of a data set that is static. Yeah? So it might be changing slowly. Yeah? Uh, so the, you know, the, the, the table of the employees in the company might be changing a little bit more slowly than you know, user interactions to the website, but it's still something that is changing. Uh, so, so the basic assumption is that all data is produced continuously on, all, all the time and the, the, the infrastructure and the programming models we use uh, adapt to that paradigm. So the, we are thinking, uh, as we are writing code, we're thinking of data as continuous. Um, the second is, uh, we, we can call this push-based versus polling. So this is, we are reacting to events instead of scheduling computation. So instead of, you know, saying, um, okay, I'm gonna now grab the next batch of data that was produced, do something with it, make some output. We are reacting to, to events. Something happens, it comes to the application, the application reacts, it outputs uh, the event. So this is sort of per event processing. Some events might be not important at all, we may discard them, but some events may actually be tremendously important and we need to react to them immediately, yeah? Um, and, and the third one is that Compute and state are collocated. I'll be talking about this in, in, in the whole talk. Um, and another one that I'm not mentioning here is that time is important. So every event will happened at some time, and this time is actually uh, important and takes uh, part in the computation. It's, uh, we need to react very differently to an event if it was generated today or yesterday. Yeah? So, some practical examples of companies that are using Avatsi Flink and what they are doing with it. These are all examples that came from, uh, most of them at least, that came from the last Flink Forward conference in San Francisco. Uh, that's the, the annual conference on Avatsi Flink. So Uber, um, so Uber is deploying Flink in a system that they call Athena X. 
uh, replacing older things that they were using, like SAMSA, Storm, etc. Uh, and, the, and, and the idea is that this is uh, an internal service in the company that a number of different teams can use uh, to, to do real-time data processing. For example, um, the, the growth teams, they are interested in how much are we earning, right? And how much are we earning actually in real time? So, you know, the most basic use case, for example, how much did we earn in San Francisco in the last five minutes? Yeah, that's a purely analytics use case. It just produces an answer. Then, you know, one level, one level up is sort of alerting, right? So, uh, the, so Uber uh, noticed that, you know, some drivers are trying to cheat the system in various ways. So they are trying to detect that, and if they detect that, they ban the driver, um, et cetera. Um, and another, another use case, then further down, is sort of we, the, they ha we have the, the models that estimate the time to arrival, yeah, from, uh, from point A to point B when you're taking a car. Uh, and then we have the live stream of trips that are happening at the same time. So joining these two in order to improve the ETA models, um, and then, uh, in the end, update what we see in the Uber app. ING, ING is a bank in the Netherlands. It's a global bank headquartered in the Netherlands. So the particular system they're building with Fling is a fraud detector system. So very similarly, we're getting now a stream of events that are credit card transactions. Um, and, they're, and they're folks um, within the company that are developing uh, fraud models. Yeah, so fraud detection used to be, uh, back in the days, a sort of simple thing. It was based on rules, like, you know, if you swipe your car, if I swipe my card in Munich now, and in two hours I swipe my card in, uh, in Moscow, then, you know, there's probably a problem, so that might be fraud. Nowadays, it's a lot more complicated, so there's a lot of machine learning in there. So fraudsters are getting more and more intelligent, and banks are trying to always be a little bit more intelligent on the process, right? It, 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 you know, it doesn't always work, but... Um, so yeah, so we're getting a stream of transactions, we're, ge we're getting a stream of fraud detection models, and then essentially, uh, you know, continuously, and in real time, we're trying to figure out, you know, was this transaction fraud or not? And, and if it was fraud, do something, yeah? Um, Netflix, um, some use cases at Netflix, very basic use case is take all the events that happen and route them to downstream systems that various teams within the company are using. Um, that's sort of a, of a router of events, if you wish. The challenging thing there was actually the, the number of events, which is, which is huge. Um, another use case that they're looking at is um, essentially uh, when we browse Netflix and we look, you know, we click on a movie or a show and then we click down, blah, blah, blah. So we're capturing all that stuff and then we are taking that and serving it as an input for the recommendations that Netflix gives us uh, for movies. Yeah, so the complete user interaction sessions. Uh, and this is just the beginning. So the way that, that Netflix is thinking about Fling is uh, they call it stream processing as a service, part of uh, a system they call uh, Keystone, which is essentially a service that is offered internally in the company for every uh, product development team in the company to use, together with a DSL, uh, together with, with the manageability layer, etc. Alibaba. Uh, Alibaba is, the, I think, the largest uh, e-commerce company in the world. Um, so Alibaba started with, it, it, they're the largest Fling user uh, known to date to me, uh, and they are a, a major contributor to the project, uh, especially in, in SQL. Uh, so the first thing that Alibaba did with Fling was um, uh, use it for uh, Alibaba search. So whenever you search something on Alibaba, there is, uh, there's a system called Alibaba search, uh, that you know, produce the search results, recommendations, et cetera. And the idea there was that if we take into account the real-time uh, purchases that are happening, yeah, then we can improve uh, actually the uh, recommendations that we produce for users, especially if we are in a period where people are buying a lot of stuff yeah, and there are trends happening. And the particular period of that in China, I'm not sure if you can see this. This is a slide from Alibaba, from, uh, from Fling Forward. So, um, 
So hundreds of linked jobs, biggest cluster, more than 1,000 nodes, biggest job has uh, tens of terabytes of states, thousands of subtasks. Um, and, and the big motivation was what in China they call Singles Day. Uh, that is similar to Black Friday in the US. It's a day that people shop a lot. And when I say a lot, uh, it means that last year Alibaba in that day made 18 billion US dollars. Yeah? Uh, so that was one of their major motivations. And they actually show that you know, using this system with Fling that they, use, that they call Bling, uh, increase their conversion uh, by 30% on singles day. So uh, a very uh, significant uh, achievement at the end in the, in the bottom line. Um, and finally, one more example. Um, that's a smaller company. Um, it's called Drive Tribe. Um, it's a startup in London. They are the social network for uh, petrol heads, and it was created by these guys, uh, the Top Gear crew. Uh, so that's a social network. It's a website. Yeah, you can you can log in, create a profile, join something, join groups that they call tribes, interact with other people, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and now, what is the, the reason that this is relevant for us today is that the way they implemented the complete social network, the complete website, was using Flink um, and a technique called event sourcing um, and uh, CQRS. That means the following, right? So, I mean, the traditional way to implement these applications is, you know, ORM mapping, MySQL or Postgres, yeah, database, the traditional stack, right? Uh, so what, what these guys uh, were thinking was that they're going to see a massive uptake because the founders are quite famous, yeah? So they would go on BBC and announce this and everything. So their user base would grow massively. So they wanted to be very elastic and very flexible and very scalable. So the way that this, that this thing is implemented underneath is that everything is an event. I click login, that's an event. It goes to Kafka. It goes to a bunch of Fling applications, et cetera. And then there are a lot of Fling applications that keep the state of the website, meaning you know, um, current recommendations, et cetera, et cetera. And then the state, state is mirrored uh, to um, Elasticsearch and Redis clusters which are there serving to the presentation layer. So what we see on the website is, ma is maintained underneath uh, by Flink state. Yeah? So that's sort of the main difference here. Instead of having the global state of the website in a big database, you are actually create, rolling out a lot of applications that keep uh, you know, the necessary state for the application that you can then present uh, to the browser. Um, and that serves actually as a good intro uh, to, to this. Um, so the common themes in all of this stuff is stateful event-driven applications. These applications can be external, meaning that they can be end-user applications that we see on an app or a website, but they can also be internal, like a fraud detector. Yeah? Uh, and the main drivers for adopting data streaming for this kind of applications are three. Uh, in, in very simple terms, it's speed, scalability, simplicity. We're going to get um, now into a little bit more detail. Um, now, when we think about writing these stateful applications, right, traditionally what we do is that first we're going to have a discussion whether we're going to use Cassandra or Postgres or whatever. We're going to pick a data model. Um, then we're going to start uh, discussing about consistency, you know, what kind of consistency what do, we, do we need, uh, what can we get away with. Um, then we're going to worry about performance in this data store. Uh, after worrying about performance, we might change our minds on consistency, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, and, you know, often what happens is that, you know, in theory it's simple, you know, database, application, yeah, but often you end up with a lot of caching layers, um, you end up with you know, a million things, buses that exchange data between databases, and essentially the problem is keeping all of the views on data up to date, right? So essentially what the, what the, the, the core problem here is that we have two very separate layers. We have a layer that does compute. Here's where we write all our code, yeah? And then we have this database layer that keeps the state of all of our applications, right? So these two boxes are two applications, and these are two different states. Um, and, and the database layer keeps both 
the current state of the world and the past states of the world or the history of the world, if you wish. Um, some problems with that is that every time we do a write, we cross a tier, so we, we cross the tier boundaries, we go to the database layer. Um, it's, uh, it's expensive uh, and, and many times it's, it's very synchronous, it's, it's more synchronous than needed. Uh, and for, for it to work in practice, many times there's a lot of casting layers in between that may not be consistent, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and if we back up a bit, why are we doing all of this stuff, right? The, the idea is that you know, if something fails, then we don't want to lose our state. And not only we don't want to lose our state, we want to be able to restore our state to exactly what it was before it failed, right? So this is the primary motivation for using a database. Otherwise, we'd store everything in memory and we'd just lose it and be okay with it. But that's never, that's never good, right? So the main idea of data streaming is the following. So events, so transactions are events, yeah? So update transactions are events. Uh, read transactions may be events. Um, and then we're collecting those in a persistent event log. Uh, that's usually Kafka nowadays. Uh, and then there are processes that uh, contain the state um, in main memory or wherever they want to contain it, uh, so that essentially they consume the log, they consume the history, and they uh, create these this, uh, memory images or materialized views, right? Um, and periodically, we can take a snapshot of a process and put it somewhere that, uh, that is durable. And at the, uh, in the case that there is a failure, we're just going to reload that. We're going to restart the event log, and we're going to replay. Yeah, so that is the main idea. And that's essentially what Fling is. That's, that's what Fling gives you. Gives you the ability to snapshot state, reload state. That's the basic Fling mechanism, which, which, uh, which is called the checkpointing mechanism. Yeah? So what we get architecture-wise is a shift from this kind of architecture to this that I will call the streaming architecture. And the main idea here is that we took the state from the, from, from the storage layer and we moved it up to the application layer. So state and the application uh, and the application code are now collocated. And what we end up is this kind of, let's say, fling layer for application, uh, for, for compute and state. And then stream storage, uh, which is the storage of the event log and the storage of the snapshots. So if you think about data, data can come in two ways. Yeah, it's either the events that happen one after another or the snapshot of a particular application. And you can always recreate the snapshot by, by uh, replaying the log. Yeah, so we have now uh, streaming, streaming compute and streaming storage. Yeah, we moved the state up. Um, and that has a lot of benefits. So, for example, right, performance. Uh, so in the, in the classic architecture, every time we do an update, we, we update the database if we want to be durable and consistent. Here, all the modifications are local. And the only time we cross the tier boundary is periodically snapshotting the state, which is a much better write pattern, right? So it's not synchronous. Um, it's, 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 uh, it's much less frequent and it just, you know, dumps big blobs, yeah? Um, if we talk about consistency, what, uh, what people were doing here is you, you have two options. You can either do distributed transactions. Uh, often what happens at scale was that, you know, people could not get this to work. So often people would resort to things like um, at most once guarantees, meaning no guarantees, or at least once guarantees, um, you know, more, uh, more relaxed forms of consistency. Um, whereas here, what you can actually get is within the application, within one application, you can get exactly one state. So at the time uh, that you recover, you will not have duplicates, you will not have lost data. And across applications, you can get um, essentially uh, snapshot consistency. So applications uh, can talk to each other uh, via the snapshots. So it's not the most fine-grained consistency that you would get with distributed transactions. It's not suitable for every application out there, uh, but it works at scale and it works for many applications. 
Um, if, we talk, if we talk about scaling, right, so if we want, if we have an application and we're getting more load, what we would have to do traditionally is scale the database, yeah, and that's the biggest problem of scaling, scaling the database, right? Uh, provisioning uh, additional database capacity, database is often shared among other applications, making sure that other applications are not affected by this, so, you know, huge, big projects, etc. What is happening here is that because state and application are collocated, uh, scaling becomes much, much easier, right? So with Flink, you can essentially, uh, with one command, uh, rescale the parallelism, and that is going to internally reshuffle the state among nodes. So it's going to take a snapshot, it's going to reshuffle the state, and it's going to continue from that, uh, and then you're good to go, right? So it's not uh, such an expensive ordeal. Um, Rolling out a new service, right? So if we talk about uh, microservices, yeah? So if we have an organization that is creating teams per microservice or teams uh, per product, right? And we want to spin out a new team that is going to build something, right? It's going to build something new. Uh, the options that we had before were, you know, either you guys choose your own database and administer it yourself, or talk to the database guys to provision additional capacity, et cetera, et cetera, which, which are both, uh, you know, not very easy. Um, what we do now is essentially just roll out a new Flink application with its own state, and the only sort of global thing that we need to add is additional backup storage, which is always um, very easy. Uh, so, so these are essentially the three main reasons, right, that I talked in the beginning. So performance, scalability, uh, microservices. Yeah, the, this is, these are the reasons that we see people moving to this kind of architecture. Uh, some other goodies. Um, let's say that you know we have we have events coming in. Uh, we have a live application, and that, that's writing stuff somewhere. Uh, we're also backing up our raw data. We're backing up our events. Let's say to a file system, and we discover that something is wrong. Yeah. What we can do here is take this exact same code, yeah, exactly, the same thing, and run it with the historical data. Well, not the exact same code. We changed the code because it was wrong. <laughs> we deploy it again, right? But it's, exact, it's the same application. We, we had a snapshot of it. We load the snapshot. We load the, the updated code. Um, we run it on the archive data, and we overwrite um, the, the results, and, and, and we, we repair the the results at the end, right? So um, if you think about it, what we used to call batch jobs, so jobs that we're running on, on files and stuff, um, this is also covered here, right? So every live application can be used as a batch job as well. And, and repairing wrong results is one use case, but maybe we want to rerun something for uh, audit reasons, right? We want to be able to prove to an auditor why did we make this decision? We can just rerun it. There are, there are, there are countless applications of this. Um, another, another good thing, uh, another good is versioning. Um, so when we talk about these snapshots, or we call them save points, essentially we can think of them as versioning. So think about versioning like, like Git for applications, and think about that plus state, right? So what you can do is you can create versions of the application as it is at various points in time. Um, you can take, you know, version at time, at, you know, yesterday 2 p.m., fork off the application with, with uh, modified code, run that one in parallel. You can run A-B tests. Uh, you can run simulations, et cetera, et cetera. So it gives you a way to version not only the code, but also the state, and, and those two together, actually. Um, another goodie that I would love to talk about a lot uh, is time. Um, so there is, so, so that's sort of something that people used to ignore mostly, and, and with this paradigm of stream processing is, is coming up. So the idea is that, you know, if something happens, if I'm playing a game on my phone and I do something, yeah, I did that at some point in time. And then you are getting that in your data center at some other point in time. For example, the, the extreme example is always if I'm on a plane and I'm playing uh, offline and then I land and I turn off the, the flying mode, then you're going to get all of these events uh, maybe 10 hours later, right? 
so then uh, what, what we need is mechanisms to handle what, what people call out of order data, yeah? So, so, so before that was, that was always a problem. Streaming gives you a natural paradigm and tools to deal with this kind of out of order data. Um, so, so this is, we, we can talk about this more um, if we have time later. So this, this is all the stuff that the Apache Beam folks have been talking about, event time, uh, late results, windowing, triggers, um, et cetera. Uh, but, but essentially, let me actually um, cut this talk uh, a little bit shorter and, and open the, and since you are all familiar with Fling, I, will, I, I would like to do a, a larger Q&A. Uh, just, just to get a feeling of Fling, if you haven't played around with this already, uh, the way that you use Fling is through a number of APIs. Yeah? Uh, the, as, as a user, as a developer. Uh, and these APIs are sort of layered, yeah? So at the bottom most layer, there is something that is called the process function. This is the lowest level API. Low level might be, you know, a, a bad word, might, might sound like a bad word, but the lowest level you get, the more flexible you are. So that's, that's like our assembly, right? Um, then we have, and then, and here sort of the paradigm is, event, state, and time. And then we have the data stream API that is thinking about data streams, so call, uh, uh, infinite collections of events, windows, triggers, etc. This follows very much the, the data flow model. Um, the table API uh, is thinking of uh, streams uh, as tables that are changing, and the table API is essentially uh, SQL-like uh, operations that are embedded in a language, so they're embedded in Scala or Java. And then on top of that, you have actual SQL, so you can write uh, normal SQL on, on streaming data. Uh, and just, just a few examples of how this thing looks like. This is the process function, you declare state, and you have one function that is process element. You get an element, you have state, you do something with it, you emit something. Um, and another function is called, you can register uh, callbacks uh, on, on time, and then you have another, uh, another function that when some time arrives, then you can do something with it. Yeah? Uh, data stream API kind of looks like that. You have data streams that are typed, you read them from Kafka or from whatever else you, you like, and then you have functions like, you have functional constructs like map, reduce, group by, window, etc. Um, table API sort of looks like that. So uh, you can think of this as, um, you know, if we remove the dots and the parentheses, et cetera, it's kind of like SQL, yeah? So here we are scanning uh, a data stream. We're windowing a group by select, and the same thing here in, in standard SQL, yeah? So these are the APIs that you have available. You can also run uh, what is called the Beam API on, or, or Apache Beam on Flink. That is the project by Google that I mentioned before. Uh, it's a separate project. It's not part of Flink, but um, it can run on Flink, and it's the, it's the best way to run it besides their own uh, cloud product. Uh, if you want to deploy Flink, we see a lot of deployments nowadays in uh, Kubernetes and some container engines like that. Uh, we see a good, a good amount of deployment, uh, deployments on Mesos. Uh, standalone deployments on VMs or machines, uh, and, you can, and you can also run it on Hadoop via Yarn. Uh, and there is, uh, of course, a rich ecosystem of connectors to get data in the system and out of the system, so Kafka, Kinesis, uh, Hadoop, Cassandra databases, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so just to open for a, for a Q&A, um, basically, my point is this, yeah, moving the state up and collocating the state with the application. For me, that is the essence of the streaming architecture, and that is what gives you all of these benefits, performance, scalability, uh, microservices. Um, if you are interested in Flink and, uh, and you, and you want to visit Berlin, there is a conference in September. Uh, so the, the annual conference um, about Flink, Flink Forward, these days we have it in Berlin and San Francisco. The next one is in Berlin in September. And if you would like to submit a talk, uh, the call of submissions is still open. Um, 
if you if you want to, there's a there's a small book. It's like this thick that I, that I wrote uh, together with Helen Friedman from Mapar. You can download that online for free. Um, and that's it. And there's another book that is being prepared, which is a proper user guide for Flink by O'Reilly, but that's not, uh, that's not completely uh, done yet. Thanks a lot, Costas. Um, if there are questions, I'll, I'll come around with the microphone so that we have them on, on record. <gasps> So if you keep all your state local in the application, isn't it very expensive in terms of resources? So uh, if you only store the events like uh, re registering a new customer and then you have to like keep in memory all your customer d database, uh, right. isn't that, don't you need lots of RAM and stuff like that? So does it really scale? Yeah, because you, you, you don't need to keep it in memory, so you can actually uh, scale to disk. So you're only limited by disk space. Internally, what Flink uses is uh, embedded in every Flink worker are instances of RocksDB, uh, which is a fork of LevelDB uh, by Facebook. And that actually stages to disk as well. So you don't keep necessarily everything in memory. You can for performance reasons, but you don't have to. Yeah. Uh, Flink manages the snapshotting of, of all that, and it manages the, the shuffling and the partitioning. So you don't, as a user, you don't install RocksDB, you don't see RocksDB, it's embedded, okay? Uh, but, but that means, but we are using it internally to be able to stage to disk, so you're not, so your state size is not limited by memory, it's limited by the aggregate disk, disk space, essentially. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? Otherwise, I would have a question regarding the use case of uh, the Tribe platform. Yeah. Um, so there's also this thing, querable state in, in Flink. Mm. They, they were basically um, loading the state to an external database. Mm. There's also querable state, so which is pretty new. Um, do you know anything if they are thinking about moving to querable state, so querying Flink directly? Yeah, so, the, so they implemented this before queryable state was out. Uh, so I know that, that these guys are interested in it. I don't know if they, if they will actually, if they're actually working on this, uh, but, but they are interested in using queryable state, and it is possible to do that. It's pretty new, right? Uh, so you know, it needs to go through some, through some testing first, <laughs> but, uh, but it's definitely possible. If there are no more questions, thanks a lot, Costas. All right. And um, enjoy Thank the you. rest of the conference. And I'm here, so if anybody wants to talk to me privately, I'm here. <laughs>